Good morning, Westwood Church. And again, I just want to welcome you to our online worship service. It's, uh, it's really great to be able to worship together on this uh, Thanksgiving weekend because um, in spite of some of the things around us and, and things that uh, we're aware of, we, we do have so much to be thankful for. If we're eating today, uh, we can be thankful. Um, if we're eating pumpkin pie, now that's something to be thankful for. Um, if we have family or friends that are surrounding us in some measure, we can be thankful. Um, if we have meaningful work uh, to do with our hands and with our minds uh, for which we can uh, provide for our families, we can be thankful. And you know, even, even with technology, which uh, stresses me out, I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity to actually um, have a worship service like this, to um, you know, sing some songs together, to continue to proclaim God's Word and invite people to follow Him and to follow His Word over technology. So even though it stresses me out and I'm glad that I'm not the one that has to make it all work, um, I am thankful for it. And so on this weekend, um, if you have the opportunity to uh, join with some other people, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's over a meal, or maybe it's just spending time together, I would encourage you to take at least a little bit of time and share with one another the things for which you're grateful for and, and why uh, you're grateful, why that's important to you. Um, so this morning, we're diving back into the, uh, the book of Acts. We're studying through this uh, New Testament book, the, the origins of the early church. And I'm really encouraging our life groups to join in on this journey together. Um, being able to take um, a 30-minute sermon and go much further and much deeper with it in your life group is really, really going to be important in this uh, coming season. You have the opportunity to read the text together, um, which is really, really key. Um, you have the opportunity to, um, to apply it uh, together and to kind of talk it through. And then you have the opportunity to hold one another accountable. And accountability in the Christian life is actually very, very key. It actually helps us to grow and to keep moving forward in our faith. When we think about the book of Acts, um, the book of Acts is a really, really exciting uh, book. It's exciting, I think, partially because it underlines or emphasizes the beginnings of the early church, the, the origins of the early church. And to be certain, while there were some amazing events and miraculous, supernatural um, activity that went on in, in the first century church, um, don't, don't forget that they had a lot of persecution and a lot of pressure that was placed on them. So the, the early church was not necessarily the idyllic church. Uh, lots of great things were done through them, but um, they also had a lot of challenges. One of the big themes throughout the entire book of Acts is the powerful um, presence and person, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, who had been promised to those first disciples. Um, and so from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, which we've talked a little bit about the first two Sundays, where Jesus promises uh, the Holy Spirit to his disciples— all the way through when the Apostle Paul is um, under house arrest in Acts chapter 28, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is absolutely everywhere. You cannot miss um, the person of the Holy Spirit. And I know that I have been highlighting this theme in the first two sermons in Acts chapter 1, but it's really only in Acts chapter 2 where we see the promise fulfilled, the promise that Jesus had given in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, fulfilled with his disciples. So I'd invite you to, you know, follow in your Bibles today in, in Acts chapter 2 as we kind of work through a, a fairly lengthy text, but um, don't worry, we're not going to get through every verse. So here's the setting. Here's the setting. It's, it's 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion. And Jews from all over the then known world are gathering from all the countryside to celebrate Pentecost. Um, Pentecost was a annual harvest festival where, where Jewish people would gather to bring their, their sacrifices, their offerings to present to the Lord. 
And those who came to this festival were either Jews by birth, um, by heritage, or they had been converted to Judaism from other cultures and backgrounds. So this is a multicultural gathering where different dialects, different languages are represented and spoken. Um, many people would have been hearing other languages and, and they wouldn't have understood what um, people right across them were, were speaking and vice versa. And the population in Jerusalem would have probably grown to um, over 120,000 people. So quite a bit bigger than the city of Prince George. It, it swelled um, at these harvest uh, festival times. And it's in this setting, it's in this setting where these early believers gathered to pray and where God gave his Holy Spirit. Now, rather than me reading Acts chapter 2, I want to invite you to watch it and listen to it acted out from the visual Bible. It might help you better understand what's going on and imagine it as you follow along in this story. So take a look. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on Egypt. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day 
of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God. So that was a little more illustrative than what I could have done. And I bet if your children are watching, um, they're going to ask you some great questions perhaps today or in the next couple of days that you now have to answer. And so uh, moms and dads, good luck on that. Questions like, um, so did they really speak in different languages and how did they do that? Um, what does it mean uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Um, how does the Holy Spirit work? Those might be some of the questions that emerge uh, from your children if they were actually watching and you kind of dig into the text a little bit. But you know what? Those aren't just questions that kids ask. Those are questions um, and, and, and issues that emerge from from other people, from older people. I hear those kinds of questions coming out of conversations um, from our own congregation. And it, it seems to me that there's always more questions about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. How does he work today? And is it any different today than what it was two millennia ago in the early church? What does it mean um, to be filled by the Holy Spirit? Must I have a supernatural experience of the Holy Spirit to be assured of my relationship with Jesus? And I think the reason for a lot of these questions has to do with what happens after the disciples have been praying intensely, together, with one mind, in unity, as I talked about last Sunday. They were doing what Jesus had asked them to do. They waited, and they prayed together, 
asking God to send his spirit, which he had promised. And then here, in the midst of this festival, were all kinds of people speaking different languages from different parts of the then known world are gathering. It's there that God chooses to send his spirit with a loud, rushing wind. And then those who are gathered there are described as being filled with the Spirit, and they start speaking in different languages. Now, depending on your personal background, and depending on personal spiritual experiences that you've had, you, you could look at this story and be totally freaked out by what just happened, uh, or you could think, wow, that's pretty cool, and I want to chase after that same kind of experience. Or you might be thinking that, that this now is prescriptive for everyone for all time. How is one supposed to understand this first century church story? What does it teach us 2,000 years after it happened? So let's unpack a, a few important details, a couple of things. So throughout the scriptures, um, the presence of God is, is often portrayed as wind and fire. So wind bringing life and fire, symbolic of both God's presence and his judgment. And so if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see powerful stories of God's presence evidenced in fire. So you have the story of Moses and the burning bush. You have the story of God leading Israel to the promised land with a, a pillar of fire um, you know, at night and a cloud by day. Um, the, the Holy Spirit is, is the third person of the Trinity. So therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. He's not just a nebulous being. He's not just kind of wind. He is not just uh, another person. He is God. So the group of 120 people, these first disciples, they are experiencing firsthand the presence and the power of God among them, just as Jesus said they would. A second important detail has to do with these different languages spoken. So, you have to understand that these were not unintelligible words. These were languages that were very understandable. It was just that the disciples had never spoken them before. So, don't confuse what's happening in Acts chapter 2 with what the Apostle Paul describes when he speaks about a gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians. See, the Apostle Paul, he describes an activity that is usually very personal between a disciple of Jesus and, and God, where what is being spoken and prayed and sung is generally unintelligible. It's a language of personal worship, the gift of tongues, we say. The languages that the disciples in Acts spoke they, they were not their native language, but they were very intelligible. See, God had gifted them, had empowered them to speak the languages of those who had come to this harvest festival. So everything that they said was perfectly understood by those large multicultural crowds. So it's absolutely amazing for these large crowds from other parts of the Middle East to hear these lowly Galileans with this bizarre accent speak to them in their own language about a man named Jesus who had died for their sin yet was alive and who was inviting them to live for him, to follow him. So, so Jesus promised in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, when he says that his disciples will receive power through his Holy Spirit to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, it's being fulfilled before their very eyes. And those disciples, they might have been thinking, wow, like this is, this is crazy. This is crazy stuff. But we're doing exactly what Jesus commanded us to do. And we're receiving his power 
a supernatural power to do it. Power that we've been talking about the last few weeks. And some people, some people are even responding to the message. So if you have ever wondered what this supernatural story is all about and how to understand it, let's clear that up and try to make sense of it and to apply it for you and me today. This story does not emphasize that everyone has to speak in another language as a sign that they've received the Holy Spirit. That's not what this story is teaching us. And this story does not emphasize that there is a a second or a subsequent blessing that comes after placing one's faith in Jesus. This story does not tell us. Luke, the historian who wrote this, is not sharing this lesson. Um, we, We know this because by the By the time we reach verse 38 in Acts chapter 2, it's clear. When the crowds ask Peter, what must we do to be saved? Peter responds and he says, repent and be baptized. Turn from your ways not walking with the Lord and turn toward Jesus and follow him by declaring that through baptism. Repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you, when you turn from your way of doing life, when you turn from sin, you repent from your sin, and you turn towards God, and you receive Jesus' forgiveness, one of the gifts that you are given is the gift of the Holy Spirit who leads you, who guides you, who convicts you and counsels and encourages and gives you the power to live a life of holiness. You get it all when you receive Jesus in faith. When you turn to Jesus in obedience, you get it all. You get Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit, you get power, you get everything all at once. It doesn't come in segments or sequences. What this story in Acts chapter 2 does emphasize is that Jesus' promise to his disciples is now being fulfilled and it continues to be fulfilled through this day, even today, and until he comes again. What this story emphasizes is that God has this huge plan for all people everywhere from all cultures and all language groups to know and to follow Jesus and to form a new unity which we call the church. Something that is completely supernatural in its origins. And God wants to use ordinary men and women, people like that group of 120, people like you, people like me, who don't go about this mission in our own strength, but who are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit to go about this mission to proclaim God's story in ways that all people understand and have an opportunity to respond. This, my friends, is the message of Acts chapter 2. And it's so amazing, and it's so simple, and yet it's so incredibly difficult to live out, because sometimes, quite frankly, we just don't get it. Let me me illustrate from personal experience. I grew up in a farming community in southern Manitoba where many Mennonites lived. Now, the Mennonites where I lived didn't talk about life in the Holy Spirit, and quite frankly, they were skeptical of those who did. Um, Far too often, we actually thought that God's plan was exclusively for the Mennonites. Uh, We even thought that God was a lover of 
borscht and farmer sausage. We were not convinced that his plan included the Hutterites to the north, and we could not imagine that his plan uh, involved the French Canadians to the west. And how we lived made it abundantly clear that there were divisions and that there were barriers for others to understand the message of God's love for them and to respond to it. Now, years later, when my, my family now, I'd been in ministry for some years and we moved from Kelowna to Abbotsford, I, I had never actually lived in a community where so many Dutch Reformed people um, lived. And I discovered over time that, that the Dutch folks had much in common with Mennonites. Both groups thought that they were God's plan A. Now, of course, I'm, you know, being a little bit humorous and tongue-in-cheek, but thankfully, we are not alone in this. While we do struggle and have struggled in our various groups and, and uh, communities over the years, these groups that were gathering for the Harvest Festival in Jerusalem, they, they would have struggled with some of the things. Some of these groups would have been shocked. How could those folks know about God and His love for them? They don't have the right last name. They're not from the right background. They, they're not from the right family circles. How is it that these lowly Galileans are speaking about God's love to us? We already know it. And right here, right here, Westwood Church, we see how God's big plan is unfolding as the Holy Spirit enters in, penetrates those people's lives and hearts, and starts breaking down barriers between people and between people groups because God's desire is that every nation, every people group, every language and tongue would hear the good news in understandable ways and respond to it. In a couple of weeks, we have the opportunity to have Dave and Louise Sinclair Peters join us, and they're going to be preaching in this series of Acts with us, and they're going to bring some stories, I'm sure, because they have awesome stories to share about the work that God is doing uh, in their lives and in the ministry that they've been entrusted. Um, and I'm sure some of the stories that they're going to be talking about have to do with, with God breaking down barriers amongst people in Southeast Asia so that they can actually come to know God personally. Dave and Louise, they work diligently at making God's story understandable to everyday folks, everyday folks who've never heard about Jesus. Some people who are living in jungles, others who are living in big cities, some people who worship monkeys, and other people who live in just total poverty. But you know what? It's not just about a people group halfway around the world that you are never going to meet and I'm never going to meet. It's about, it's about the folks all around you. It's about the folks all around us. People right in our neighborhood. Like the Koreans and the Africans on my street. God's Spirit wants to break down the barriers that exist as he invites those people to himself, and he wants to use me. It's the first nations, communities in our city. People who often um, experience isolation from other people. And God wants to break down those walls by his spirit, and God wants to make his plan understandable to them. And he wants to use us. And it includes the Filipino community around our church property. And it includes the Indo-Canadian community playing cricket in the field behind us. And it includes the old colony Mennonites uh, to the west of Prince George who may struggle with legalism because they have not understood God's plan very well. 
And he wants to break down the walls and the barriers in the LGBTQ community who need to know both God's love and his design for creation in ways that make sense, in ways that are understandable. And, and, and. The communities and the people groups exist all around and the barriers sometimes get pretty high. And in Acts chapter 2, we're shown that the Holy Spirit invades our lives and he is capable of breaking down those barriers. I don't have to tell you about the news stories of racism and prejudice the past number of months, but we need to be very, very mindful that it's not just out there we need to actually look at our own lives and bring it really close to home. I've witnessed many people within our church family live out the message of Acts 2 in amazing ways. Men and women, younger and older, boys and girls, bringing down the barriers, living out God's love with anyone and everyone. That is so awesome, and you need to know that you are an encouragement and an example to me because I need to take lessons from you in this regard. But most of us haven't arrived, and inevitably, some do struggle with these barriers. They do struggle with prejudices and biases and racist attitudes. And the, the message of Acts 2 maybe hasn't fully um, grabbed your heart or captured your heart. And, and there isn't a, a clear understanding of God's plan to make his love story known to all people in understandable ways. If God, if God is doing a work in your heart in this regard, or if he is speaking to you and convicting you of of wrong attitudes towards other people groups. Do you know what? The good news is that you can, you can start fresh. You can uh, begin today by confessing that sin and, and starting a new direction, a new pathway. But you need to know that the Bible says that someday people from all nations, from all tribes, from all tongues will be worshiping Jesus in heaven. So why not... Why not, Westwood Church? Why don't we start living out this spiritual reality today by loving and showing God's love to those from all kinds of corners and segments of society and community groups? People whom we may sometimes think don't deserve God's love or cannot imagine how they could receive it. But here's the thing. Why would your classmate, why would your neighbor, why would your coworker, or your employee care at all about what you think of Jesus if they never saw you live that out? Live that love out for all kinds of people. Within our city, I would guess that you're going to be able to apply this lesson this week. Maybe, maybe even today. And you know, when I think about this, when I think about this kind of reality of Acts chapter 2, I, I kind of think that God has a bit of a sense of humor. Because in the Old Testament, there's the story of the Tower of Babel, where, where people wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to glorify them, themselves and lift their own lives up. And so they went about building this tower that was going to reach you know, to the heavens, as high as they could go. They really, really wanted to become gods in their own eyes. So what did God do? God gave them different languages so they couldn't understand one another as they went about this building project, and the building project came to a halt. And the people scattered, gone, vamoosed. And yet here in Acts chapter 2, in this crazy reversal, these festivals to worship God brought diverse people 
together from all kinds of corners of the world together to present their offerings and their sacrifices and to lift up the name of Yahweh. And as God gave the Holy Spirit to his disciples, the Spirit sent those folks back to their home communities to worship Jesus in their native languages where past barriers were now broken and the church began to form. Absolutely amazing. So for you and for me, what's our part in Acts chapter 2? How do we live this out even today as we think about what it meant two millennia ago? How can we apply this? And I just want to suggest several very practical ideas. First, pray for an opportunity to share the gospel with one person this week. Pray for an opportunity to share God's story with one other person this week. I'm not asking you to force anything or to manipulate anything. I'm asking you to pray for an opportunity. It must start with prayer. Ask God to open your heart. Ask God to open your your eyes to the opportunities. And more than the opportunities, to the people. Ask God to open your your eyes and your heart to the people. People who are different than you. People who come from different backgrounds and languages and cultures. Ask God if you have some hard edges uh, towards some groups or some uh, community segments. um, Ask God to soften your heart to those who are different than you are or who think differently than you. And then ask God to use you. Ordinary you yet empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the story of God's love, to live out the story of God's love in understandable and practical ways. But it must start with prayer. Then second, act when the opportunities arise. So when we pray, we shouldn't be surprised when God answers those prayers. So be prepared to act. You know, Peter, he shared that story of what Jesus had done. He was bold. He um, probably took a lot of courage. And then he invited the crowd's response. And I I don't think anything has really changed 2,000 years later. We're still called as disciples of Jesus to live lives of holiness. And we're still called to testify of what the Lord has done for us and in us. Um, Peter says later on in, in his letter, Uh, to the church, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So we act on the opportunities when they arise. We don't force them, we don't manipulate them, but we do act on them. And then we leave the results with God. We have to leave the results with God. So empowered by the Holy Spirit, as God moves in us and through us, just like Peter and the rest of the disciples did what they were called to do, we must do the same. We faithfully live out our lives and we testify to God's grace and mercy in our life to many different people and many different cultures, people all around us. When Peter did that, he was doing it to people who were speaking different languages, came from different cultures, had all kinds of different ideas about who God was. And some people in that crowd, they were receptive. In fact, the Bible says that 3,000 people um, believed. But we also know that many more rejected the message. So yay, 3,000 people received it, but many more rejected what the disciples um, had been talking about, and they thought that they'd been drinking too much. But that's no different than today. Some people receive God's plan as we pray and as we act on the opportunities, as we live out this love story that God has for us, and some people reject it. Um, As I think back over the years, I hold several memories really, really tightly. Memories where where God moved mightily. Where God gave me the opportunities 
uh, to share his, his story, and people responded. I remember about 20 years ago when I was a youth pastor, I woke up one morning and I had one thought on my mind, and I know it was from, from the Lord, uh, and the thought was around this, this girl in our youth group, Tina, and Tina had been asking questions, and she'd been in a discipleship class, and she was, I knew she was close to finally uh, surrendering her life to Jesus. And I woke up with one thought uh, that morning, and that thought was that Tina was, uh, was going to give her life to Jesus that day. I had plans to uh, meet with her and one of her friends uh, who had been a part of this discipleship class. And over the course of that time together, I, um, I was so convinced that she was, she was ready to give her life to Jesus. And so I simply asked her the question at, at, uh, you know, at one point. I said, is there anything preventing you? Like, is there anything stopping you from trusting Jesus and giving your life to him to, like today, like right, right now. And she looked at me and she said, no, I, I, I want to do this. I want to follow Jesus. And so right there in, in Dairy Queen, Tina uh, surrendered her life to Jesus. Today, she's a married woman and she married uh, one of uh, the guys in that youth group, and they have several children, and they are walking faithfully with Jesus. And a story like that encourages me in my own walk and ministry because it encourages me to stay faithful in my witness to Jesus. And I wished that I had dozens of stories like that, and I wish that we'd experience that all the time. Except I know that for every Tina, there have been dozens more who have simply walked away, or who simply don't care. But you know what, church? Just because more people spurn the message of Jesus than receive it, or just because more people don't care, doesn't mean that we stop bringing the good news of Jesus, sharing the story that God has for all people by loving them as God does, by faithfully and consistently living out our lives as servants of Jesus, and by testifying to his work in us, all through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we leave the results with God. And so may God bless us as a church family as we continue to lift up this story in Acts chapter 2 and live it out as a church family. Let me pray for us as we conclude our worship services. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for uh, this reminder in your word, for the love that you have for all people and how you you give us what we need to share it with others. Lord, we invite you to help us to bring down the barriers, to be, to be a catalyst in that regard in our own city, in our own community, to be um, a beacon in Prince George, that we be known as people, as men and women who truly love others and who want them to see a life well lived following you. And so on this Thanksgiving weekend, we just invite you to remind us of this and to live it out. We pray that you would give us opportunities to share this story, to live out this story in practical ways. Prepare us, equip us, and then spur us on as we take the opportunities. And so go with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wish you a wonderful day. And a great long weekend as you have the opportunity to celebrate uh, on this Thanksgiving with your friends and your family. Go in peace.